God sent his son, they called him Jesus, is a hymn by Bill and Gloria Gaither. I've always liked it, but it, it has become very special indeed because it was sung at the wedding of my son Jonathan and daughter-in-law Brianna back in September 2019. Bill Gaither celebrated his 85th birthday just a few days ago on the 28th of March. He was born on a farm in Indiana way back in 1936. He went to university and became an English teacher. He married Gloria in 1962. For a few years he combined teaching and music, but in 1967 he decided to concentrate on his music full time. We have the Gathers to thank for a number of hymns. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Let's just praise the Lord. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The King is coming. Jesus, there's just something about that name. He touched me. Something beautiful. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. The King is coming. These are just some of the, the hundreds of hymns that they have written. And today's hymn, God sent his son it would be one of their most well known. I want to speak about the dreadful fear behind the hymn and then the definite facts within the hymn and then the delightful faith throughout the hymn. The dreadful fear. Gloria Gaither herself speaks about this. She said, I am a wife and a mother. It was in the middle of the upheaval in the 1960s that we were expecting our third baby. The drug culture was in full swing. 
existential thought had obviously saturated every area of our American thought. The cities were seething with racial tension and the God is dead pronouncement had giggled its way all through our educational system. On the personal front, Bill and I were going through one of the most difficult times in our lives. Bill had been discouraged and physically exhausted by a, a bout with mononucleosis. And in that weakened condition had little reserve to fight the psychological battle brought on by some external family problems. Someone whom we had cared about a great deal had hurled some accusations at us and at the fellowship of believers and at the whole, exist the whole idea of the existence of God. It was on New Year's Eve that I sat alone in the darkness and quiet of our living room, thinking about the world and our country and Bill's discouragement and the family problems and about our baby, Jan Born. Who in their right mind would bring a child into a world like this, I thought. The world is, is so evil, influences beyond their control are so strong. What will happen to this child? And so, do you understand, there was fear, dreadful fear. But then, these facts, definite facts, Gloria, you see, continues. I can't quite explain what happened at that moment, but suddenly I felt released from it all. The panic that had be begun to build inside was gently dispelled by a reassuring presence that engulfed my life and drew my attention. Gradually the fear left and the joy began to return. I knew I could have that baby and face the future with optimism, optimism and trust. It was the resurrection affirming itself in our lives once again. It was life conquering death in the irregularity of my day. Here's another part of the story. Discouraged and concerned, they can remember praying and looking for signs of hope. A few months later in the spring, Bill walked out of his office to inspect a newly paved parking area for the building in which he worked. Construction workers had covered it with several layers of asphalt. Bill was satisfied with the job they did, but as he turned to go back inside, he noticed a tiny blade of grass poking through the layers of rock and tar to find its way to the sunlight. Jesus lived. He died, but he lived again, and he still lives. A few months later, their child was born. They already had two daughters, and now they had a son, Benji. And in verse and verse 2 of the hymn was actually the first verse that they wrote. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives, but greater still, the, the calm assurance the child can face on certain days because he lives, because the Lord Jesus lives. It says Gloria, we now had the courage to say, because Christ lives, we can face tomorrow and keep our heads high. Hopefully, that could be of meaning to other people too. And then verses 1 and 3 were written. In verse 1, an empty grave is there to prove my Saviour lives. This definite, this indisputable fact. The only reasonable explanation for the empty tomb is the risen Christ. And then faith, delightful faith throughout this hymn. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fe fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Bill has declared our calling is not just making music but communicating the reality of Christ. And as Christians in Christ, because of Christ, we can have faith for living and faith for dying. Verse 3, and then one day I'll cross that river. I'll fight life's final war with pain and then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns. In connection with this third verse, Gloria has said that she wrote it just to make the song complete. But when her father died suddenly, 
this verse came alive for her. She and Bill and Bill's brother Danny had to perform at a concert in Chicago the day after her father was called to heaven. And during the concert, Danny started to sing that third verse. It was as though I had never heard it before, said Gloria. The truth of the resurrection poured in and I could hear my father saying, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That is how personal that song is. So in this, this hymn, dreadful fear behind it, definite facts within it, delightful faith throughout it. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Said the Lord Jesus himself in John 14 and 19, Because I live, ye shall live also. F.B. Meyer said that in verses 18 and 19 of that chapter, there are three paradoxes. Firstly, I will not leave you orphans, I, I come unto you. And so Meyer says we can enjoy the perpetual recognition of the advent of Christ. And then a second one, the world beholdeth me no more, but ye behold me, says Meyer. We may enjoy the perpetual recognition of the presence of Christ. And then the third one, this one, because I live, ye shall live also, says Meyer. We may enjoy the perpetual recognition of the living Christ. Meyer calls this one of the many life verses in this gospel, which shine like stars in the firmament of scripture. Because I live, ye shall live also. We live by his life. We live in his life. We live because he lives in us. Says Meyer, let us draw on this life more confidently, availing ourselves of it perpetually in all our time of need, in all our time of sickness and of our wealth and adversity and prosperity in the hour of mortal anguish and the day of judgment and finding what we could not do or bear or encounter. Jesus can do and bear and meet in us and through us to the Father's eternal glory. Here's Charles Spurgeon. It must be enough to make believers live that Christ lives. For Christ's life is a proof that his work has accomplished the absolution of his people from their sins. He would have been in the tomb to this hour had he not made a complete satisfaction for their sins but his rising again from the dead is the testimony of God that he has accepted the atonement of his dear son his resurrection is our full acquittal then if the living Christ be our acquittal how can God condemn us to die for sins which he has by the fact of Christ's resurrection declared to be forever blotted out if Jesus lives how can we die shall there be two deaths for one sin the death of Christ and the death of those for whom he died. God forbid that there should be any injustice with the Most High. The very fact that Jesus lives proves that our sin has been atoned for, that we are absolved and therefore cannot die. Moreover, he is the surety for his people under bonds and pledges to bring his redeemed safely home. His own declaration is, I give unto my sheep eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any pluck them out of my hands. Will he break his covenant bonds? Shall his surety ship be cast to the winds? It cannot be. That's Spurgeon. And a final quote from Gloria Gather herself. To me there was nothing quite so sweet as holding in my arms our newborn baby. To know that this was our child, ours to love and care for, ours to feed and clothe, ours to teach and guide. But with the pride and joy also came the realisation that this child was going to face a world that was not very beautiful. And a baby is not a new toy, but an immortal soul. I don't think I would have the courage to look our little babies in the face in the light of today's headlines if it were not. For the fact of an empty tomb, a risen Lord, and a philosophy of life that makes sense when the world doesn't. A philosophy that brings life into focus, gives beauty for ashes, puts hope in the heart. When the days are uncertain, the future is sure, sure because of a man called Jesus. I can look at our babies in the face and say, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because I know all fear is gone, because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives.